you take care of all the rest there for me. Thank you. Well, we'll try this and uh, well, and we'll figure this out. Sorry. Now to bring our thoughts and hearts back to where we were. Mark chapter eight. Mark chapter 8, and we're going to be studying verses 34 to 37, not exactly the whole portion. But as you recall, those who have been with us through the study of Mark chapter 8, Jesus had performed the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. The Pharisees, they had demanded Jesus show them a sign that he was the Christ. He refused. Um, he then entered a boat. He warned the disciples to be wary of the Pharisees and the, the leaven of the Pharisees, their false doctrine, which basically was a self-righteous path to hell. On leaving the boat, Jesus healed a blind man from Bethesda and then he proceeded to ask the disciples who people were saying that he was. And some said John the Baptist. Some were saying that he was uh, uh, Elijah the prophet. And some said, well, he's another of the prophets. And Jesus then asked his disciples directly, who do you say that I am? And Peter confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now, having heard this true confession, Jesus then proceeded to teach his disciples of his purpose in coming that he would suffer many things, that he would be rejected by the, the rulers and the Pharisees, he would be killed, and then he would rise from the dead. On hearing this, Peter rebuked Jesus, saying, this will not happen. Where Jesus then answered and said to Peter in verse 33, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. The reason that Jesus spoke this way to Peter, rebuking him as Satan, was because the statement that Peter was making, that it was the same level as the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness. Satan had come tempting Jesus to forego the cross, bow before him, and he would give to him all the kingdoms of the earth, and he would not have to go and suffer and be rejected of men and killed on the cross. Just one bow, one sign of allegiance to Satan, and all would be his. Jesus then brings it down to our level, and he calls the people with his disciples and says to them in verse 34, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What is it that Jesus is saying here? Just as he would not gain the kingdoms of the world by kind of skirting past the cross, so a person does not gain the kingdom of heaven without first denying oneself, taking up his cross, and following Jesus. You now, we've sung in the past, I must reach heaven's home by the way of the cross. There is no other way but this. I will never have sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. I must journey on in the blood-washed way, the rough, thorny path he trod. I'm determined to run till the race is won, and my soul is at home with God. So I bid farewell to the way of the world, to walk in it no more. <laughs> For my Lord says, come, and I seek my home where he waits at the open door. Yes, the way of the cross leads home. Till I reach the goal, it's the joy to know the way of the cross leads home <coughs> to come after Jesus or, or to come behind means to attach yourself to him. If you or any other person has a desire to attach yourself to Jesus, to be known as one of his, to be known as a follower, a disciple, here is what we are called to do. You must deny yourself. You must say goodbye to that old sinful self. Those who are regenerated, those who are converted by the Holy Spirit, have a new man, 
It's the old man that has to be shown the door. The person who denies self gives up self-reliance, self-seeking heart, self-righteousness. Whatever is of that old sinful mindset and of that nature, instead of self-reliance, there's to be denial of self. A full dependence for salvation on God. Full dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. This denial covers the love of the world. It covers false religious mindsets, the reliance on one's own works and religious zeal, such as legalistic hearts like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Life and, and, and though patterns that cannot be harmonized with trust in Christ are often right there in front of us. And so close to our hearts, they must be denied. We must trust Christ alone. The old must die. Peter, Peter, or so sorry, Paul, the apostle, he later confessed in Philippians 3, verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And Count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Brothers and sisters, is this true for you? Is this true for me? Can we say this with full conviction that those things that we have loved and held up as precious and good, those things that we have trusted in, do we now see their weakness and inabilities that all our self centeredness, all our self righteousness, all those desires and works, do we consider them, as Paul did, as rubbish, as garbage, to be thrown out? And that the loss of all these things that we once depended on, we now count them as nothing in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ. And then taking up our cross and following him, suffering the loss of all things, that we may gain our Lord Jesus Christ. The underlying figure that Jesus is presenting to all who are there and also to us today is that of a criminal, a condemned man who is being taken to the place of execution. He is being forced to carry his cross. However, there's a difference in that for the criminal, it's a forced cross carrying. He's under duress. But for the true disciple of Jesus, it is one that, yes, it is full of pain, it's full of shame, it's full of persecution, it's full of self-denial, as we've said, denial of the world, but it is one in which the cross bearer is no longer a criminal, because Christ died for us, and therefore we now can joyfully and willingly and lovingly take up our cross, and we can, by faith, follow our Lord. The call is foremost to follow Christ. This call is one of continuing, where it begins at conversion when we're regenerated and we hear the call of Christ to stand and take up our cross and follow him. And it's a continuing thing. Once we take up our cross, we're not to put the cross down. Those who begin to follow must keep on following Jesus, following him in suffering, following him in death, following him in life, follow him in simple trust and in complete surrender, follow in gratitude for salvation, for the hope we have in him. First Peter chapter two and verse 21 says, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He left us an example of this. We're to follow in those footsteps, his steps. The great importance or the urgency and the response to this call of Jesus, it's then laid out for us in verse 35 through 38. And each verse begins with the word for each of these four sentences. They present the basic 
or the basis for the, the command that's been given by Jesus in verse 34. And this is important as it does emphasize the consequences that one faces for their refusal to deny self, to take up the cross and follow Jesus. And so this is a very serious and, and an important call of Jesus. So note verse 35, the question of whether one will win or lose. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. This is a, a paradox. This is written in that form. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Who loses his life will save it. If, if you want to hang on to your life, if you want to keep control of it and live it your way, hold your sin, cherish your sin, yes, you can do that. But in the end, you're not going to win. You're going to lose. And what a great loss because it says you lose your life. You can keep your life, even, even uh, seem to save your life, but only temporary. But you will lose it eternally. This is, uh, again, Jesus is speaking to a great multitude who are following Jesus, but only physically at this time. And so the, the call for them was, well, if you're going to be a true disciple of mine, you have to deny yourself. But if you desire to save that life that you live in this world, that you have this mindset of self and, and for this, this, the things of this world, not the things of God, you're going to lose it. And you're going to lose it eternally. This is really about hell. Eternal conscious existence in hell. A loss that is so, so horrible. Listen to most of today's counseling and, and pop psychology, and they give people tools to save their lives. Uh, some things really do help people to live better, even live more fulfilling lives in this world, but they do not keep them from losing their lives in the context that Jesus is talking about. You can make your earthly life comfortable. You can dust all the dirt off and look like you have it all together, but still end losing your life. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not talking about saving your life by doing something noble in life. There are many noble things people do in the world. And they do them while not following Christ. There are some wonderful nurses and doctors in the world. There are the great police officers. There are many noble soldiers who fight in battles to bring down evil in this world. Help those who are weak and poor, can't fight for themselves. Noble causes. They're accomplished by people who are noble in this world. But that is not what Jesus is talking about here. Note but whosoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Jesus is not saying that if you're a hero in the world that you will save your life. It all has to do with Christ and the gospel. Have you given up yourself for Christ Jesus? Have you lost your life, died to self, and have your affection set upon Christ and Christ alone and believe the gospel? You can die rescuing people from drowning. It's not going to take you to heaven. It's a noble act. You can die feeding the masses of starving people in the world. That is a good and noble act. But those things don't take a person to heaven. <coughs> All these noble acts we must do, we should do should have a care for those in this world when they're in need. But those things must never be viewed as our path to salvation. 
It is only when you lose your life, the old man is given up, yielded up, put to death, dies for Christ and the gospel. That's what saves. Such willingness, such humble self-sacrificing willingness, of course, comes when the Holy Spirit makes clear the reality of that state of lostness that we're born in. That lost state. And that there is an eternal hell for those who seek to save their own lives. An eternal glory for those who lose their lives for Christ in the gospel. If your desire is to save his life, will lose it. And whosoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels <clears throat> will save it. Moving on into verse 36, we learn then what it is to gain and have a loss. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Now, here's a question that most people seek to avoid. They avoid it by looking at life only in the present and in the body. Even for us who are saved, we, we can kind of fall back into that mindset where we're so focused on life here and now in the body that we neglect what is more precious and more valuable, which is the soul. What does Jesus mean by gaining the whole world here? Someone here might answer, well, that could mean becoming rich, gaining wealth beyond what one really needs. Well, I don't believe that's what Jesus is meaning. There, there's a verse in the Bible that says the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. Yes, there are dangers and temptations that come with the accumulation of wealth, but there are also good things that can come with it. That is a caring heart for the needs of, say, our missionaries and others. Preaching of the gospel. Helping brothers and sisters in need. Another person might say, well, it means all the pleasures that one can enjoy. They would say that the only pleasures we as Christians can enjoy are just kind of spiritual type. And I would have to disagree. There's nothing sinful to gain uh, pleasure eating a delicious meal, which I hope to have a real good one this afternoon. <laughs> or going on a vacation, enjoying some of the nicer climates in the world. Those are great pleasures, aren't they? And there's nothing wrong with that. For some people, they get pleasure taking a stick and hitting a little white ball around a field and <laughs> chasing it around until they get in a little hole and they pull it out and then they go do it again. For them, that's great pleasure. Uh, there, are, there are many pleasures found between the relationships between husband and wife, between a company of guys, even chatting over a cup of coffee. Just pleasure. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Some find solitude to be a pleasure, it's being alone. Others, they have to have a loud family. But to gain the whole world in the context of Jesus, it has to do with the love of one's heart. 1 John 2.15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. It's the mindset of the world. It's where the, the love of the things of the world, rather than the love for the one who made the world. Jesus is asking, what does a person gain if they love the world and not Christ? What do you win if you set your love and affection only on the things of this world that are temporary and not on him? What have you gained if you got everything the world has to offer, but your soul is then cast into hell? Such an important question, isn't it? This reminds us of the parable Jesus told in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12.
and at verse 16. He spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. There I'll store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Again, Jesus was not saying it was wrong to have crops. It was also not a statement of you can't enjoy what you grow. You can't enjoy the fruit of your labor. The point being made concerns the heart that lives for the riches of this world, neglecting Christ who is the priceless treasure and having no thought for eternity. This is a warning to those who look to what they accumulate in this life to just give them a sense of being alive. They, they look at this life as being the only heaven and that death means the end of all things. Therefore, do all you can. Enjoy life now. Uh, just get what you can because that's it. It's the only one you have. So they think and act accordingly. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you may die. The Latin poet Cantillus wrote, let us live and let us love and let us value the tales of austere old men at a single half penny. Suns can set and then return again. But for us, when once our brief light sets, there is but one perpetual night through which we must sleep. You know, millions live their lives here in Canada in much the same way. They live it up. They seek to fill their lives and, and give purpose to their existence because this is it. Live for today. Tomorrow may not come. There are many even who believe there is heaven and hell, but they still live with that same mentality. Get as much out of life as you can. Spend all your waking hours obtaining things, building up a personal kingdom without regard for their soul before God and eternity and that which is eternal. Job 31, 24 says, if I have made gold my hope or have said to the fine gold, you are my confidence. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great, because my hand had got much. If I beheld the sun when it shined or the moon walking in brightness, and my heart has been secretly enticed, or my mouth has kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. What does Jesus say about all those who put their trust in their riches? And those who live only for this life and the things that are of this world that they can obtain in this life. He said to that farmer, but God said to him, you fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then who shall those things be which you have provided? That man gained the whole world, but he lost his soul. He gained the things of this world, but he lost his soul. Lost to eternal hell. Lost without any means of escape. Because once in hell, forever in hell. There's no layaway plan. No, no way to put down a few dollars here and there over time. Paying oneself out of it. Lost for eternity. And we see in verse 37, the exchange rate. For what will a man give in exchange for a soul? This statement brings to our attention just how valuable the soul is. We spend millions 
for we, I mean the world in general, we spend millions of dollars on our bodies every year. We spend millions on our emotions, but what do we spend on our soul? Our soul is, apart from salvation, the greatest blessing from God. Now, don't get me wrong. There is preciousness with the body as well. One day we will have an incorruptible body when we are raised in that great resurrection when Christ comes. But our soul is also so, so precious and valuable. Our soul makes us unique in God's creation. God created man, he breathed into him, and he became a living soul. Without that soul, we wouldn't have even this life to live. But how much attention does our soul get while we live in this world? The soul it says that sins shall die. The soul will be called and re be required of us when we die. The soul goes at death and returns to God who gave it. The soul that does not deny self and take up the cross and follow Christ will be cast into hell, prepared for the devil and his angels. So what can a person give in exchange for a soul? Now, this is a rhetorical question. The answer is in the question. A man in his spiritually dead state will give nothing in exchange for a soul. Absolutely nothing. They, they don't have any care about it. Their mindset is on the world and the flesh. They do not mind the things of God. Also, in hell, there will not be anything that a man can give in exchange for a soul. Today, the unregenerated man and woman will not give anything for their soul in exchange for their soul. And in hell, they won't have anything to give in exchange for their soul so that they can be pardoned and somehow released from hell. Abraham said to the rich man who had died and was in torments of hell, he said, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. That's how definite it is. There is no earthly amount that can pay to have a soul saved. Not one penny. Elon Musk is said to be the richest man. He's worth over $220 billion. I've emailed and asked him to adopt me, but uh, <laughs> haven't heard back. Uh, just joking. Along with Musk, there are an estimated 2,668 billionaires whose total net worth equals $12.7 trillion. Now, that's a number that I can't even imagine. Can't even imagine in those numbers. It is an amount that can buy a lot of luxury in this world. It, it's, it can buy a lot of power in this world. It can feed a lot of mouths. It can wield uh, a lot of power, but it has no power nor value enough to save a soul. It can't save it now, nor can it save and pay for one's way out of hell. 1 Peter 1.18, it says, <clears throat> Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The only payment that is valuable and powerful enough to save a soul is the payment made on the cross, <coughs> the cross of Christ. There are many old new songs that reflect on the assurance we have in the promise and hope of our salvation and 
it always comes to this truth. It's Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I know whom I have believed. It is well with my soul. Just names a few. And in this passage, Peter reminds the Christians that I've just read. He was reminding Christians who were exiled in the world. They were throughout the world. But though they may not know where they were in terms of where they were going to have to be living next, being exiled, being moved from one place to another, or what troubles were coming, what persecutions were rising from the world, their hope was built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We've been redeemed. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing. But it's been paid for. There was a great exchange made. And that was Jesus' blood and righteousness. God was not bribed with the things of this world that he created. He'll never be bribed by money or power or fame or fortune that people come and stand with. Or even the religious zeal that someone has apart from Christ, their legalism. All those things are, have no, no attraction to God. Gold and silver could not redeem us. Uh, blood of bulls and goats in the old covenant. They could not redeem us. But the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Money? Power? Religious service? No. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing saves the soul except the precious blood of Christ. It is in him. It's through him we live and have life and we have hope for eternal life. Oh, what a savior this is. Oh, what a savior. Our hope is in Christ who is slain. Died for our sin. To pay for our sins. But it doesn't end there. Because our hope is in the living Christ Jesus who is raised up from the dead. He defeated death. He ascended to the glory that was his with the father before time began. It is Christ. Therefore, we place our faith and hope in, in this life. The hope of the resurrection of the last day and in to eternity. The missionary doctor to the continent of Africa, David Livingston, said, People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice, which is simply acknowledging a great debt we owe to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own reward and healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny? It is emphatically no sacrifice. Rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, danger, forgoing the common conven conveniences of this life. These may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing compared with the glory which shall later be revealed in and through us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. How precious is your soul to you? What's your soul worth? What will you give in exchange for your soul? Again, how, how valuable do you think your soul is? It was valuable to God. So valuable that he sent his son to provide the purchase price, namely his own death, to buy your eternal soul. In mind, you know, every soul is going to be existing forever. 
Will it be in hell forever or heaven forever? The answer of where is in whom you trust. Self or Jesus Christ? Have you come after Jesus? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. Amen. Mm -hmm.